Richard Wolff has some great talks, and recently I watched one from him called Socialism for Dummies, which has some great information and history. The only problem is, both parts together are almost two hours of video. While you can certainly watch the talks, this video will be condensing the most important information with some of my own commentary included. Let's get started. For a while in America now, there seems to be a lot of taboo around discussing alternatives to capitalism, even in an age where its failings are becoming more obvious to everyday people. We're allowed to talk about heavy subjects like education, healthcare, and marriage equality, but socialism is always off the table. The only time we're allowed to speak of such a subject is when we are berating it. Richard Wolff notes that during his earlier days of teaching, that his students would consider the words socialist, communist, anarchist, Marxist, and terrorist as synonyms. Obviously, this is a bit childish. Our fear and lack of discussion about socialism has led people to connotate it with atrocities instead of hope. This facade, however, is fading away. We have capitalist crises like climate change and constant crashes that are pushing more people, especially younger generations, to radicalize and learn about these no-no words of economics. Bernie Sanders becoming so prominent in the past few decades is proof that more and more Americans want to answer the question amidst the chaos. What else is there? Is there something better than capitalism? Interestingly enough, socialism wasn't always considered a bad thing. Like marijuana, communism was one of those things people could be open about in the American 1930s. We weren't taught to hate it yet. This openness made it harder to strawman socialists. As Richard Wolff notes, it's very hard to demonize socialists and communists when your Aunt Mary is one. So what killed this openness? Why were Americans taught to hate socialists? Well, businesses weren't too fond of the New Deal in the 1930s and targeted the groups of people responsible for it, specifically socialists and communists, and broke them up. Large corporations then slowly consolidated media control into monopolies that push the kind of agenda they prefer. It's why, whether liberal or conservative-leaning stations, you will never find anti-capitalism in popular American news media. While they won't put socialism up for discussion, they sure seem to love throwing around the word just like Richard Wolff's old students did, slapping the label around on people like Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders, two very different politicians. But this label is slapped on to even more radically different people as well. Hugo Chavez called himself a socialist, a previous French president, François Hollande, ran as a socialist, the USSR was the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, even the People's Republic of China calls themselves socialist. Well, hold on a minute. Despite both calling themselves socialists, I think we can all agree that Bernie Sanders isn't anything like China. This use of the word socialism for so many different things, it's confusing. How did it get like this? And to explain that, we need to get into the history of socialism and where the thought of it began. It all started in France at a time when they were still practicing a system of economics called feudalism. You had lords, serfs who worked for the lords, and the church who made sure it stayed that way. Eventually, there was a violent, and in today's terms, capitalist revolution against feudalism. The French Revolution's mantra was liberty, equality, and fraternity, and it was believed that through individualism and capitalism that they could achieve these three goals. Capitalist revolutionaries hoped to destroy the hierarchy of serfs and lords, and instead of being born into such castes, everyone would all start at the same point. The focus was on the individual and their freedom to do anything they wanted as long as it didn't hurt anyone else. Fast forward to around half a century later and capitalism was successfully replacing feudalism in Europe. However, Europeans were starting to realize that capitalism was selling them short on the liberty, equality, and fraternity that their revolution promised. Capitalists and workers replaced lords and serfs. They were not becoming equal, but instead quite the opposite. Naturally, as with any other economic system such as slavery, this births critiques of the capitalist system. Critics argued that capitalism had recreated many of the problems that France had before the revolution and that it's odd to expect individuals only working in their best self-interest to benefit the larger community, as Adam Smith had theorized. These critics believed that the community, not the individual, should be the priority, and they decided that, since they were not individualists, that they would consider themselves socialists. Just as capitalism spread quickly to every country, so too did socialism, the critique of capitalism. Socialism is capitalism's shadow. Where capitalism exists, so too will critics of the system, as anyone, just as early socialists did, can naturally find problems with the system over time. Capitalism makes the same promises and continually fails to deliver. However, due to this fast spread over so many different countries and cultures, socialism has meant many different things to the people who try to interpret it. For there to be one socialism that everyone follows is what Richard Wolff calls a fantasy for people who don't know much about this. 
Socialism was mostly just about critiquing capitalism for not delivering on the French Revolution's promises, and putting the community first to eventually achieve those promises. Socialism was just a set of ideas, not an instruction manual. These ideas were added on to as socialism continued to exist. Marx, who was fond of the French Revolution, joining current existing socialists, added that capitalism was not the vehicle in which the people should achieve socialism, and thus liberty, equality, and fraternity, but instead that it was the obstacle. Marx popularized the idea that workers taking charge of economic decisions, owning their means of production, such as the factory and tools, would get us closer to the original goals of the French Revolution. It takes what capitalists concentrated in the hands of a few people and equalizes it out to the workers. The first major split in socialist thought was how we were going to make the transition from capitalism to these worker co-ops. Revolutionary socialists argued that socialism would reign in similar to capitalism, with a bloody, violent revolution. Evolutionary socialists, on the other hand, argued that because a majority of the people, the workers, liked their ideas, and because the state had more military power than them, that they could make parties and use that political power to transition. Regardless, these were both ideas that wanted the same goal. Capturing the state, whether it be by killing those who participate in it or by beating them at their own game, to then use its power as a vehicle to usher in socialism. For clarification, the state was never the end goal. It was the vehicle of transition. In the late 19th century, both evolutionary and revolutionary routes were tried, both scoring wins here and there. Lenin, who, like American Eugene V. Debs, was in exile for telling people not to fight other workers in the capitalists' Great War, told his party, the Bolsheviks, to capture the state since they were weak due to losing the war, and despite being called crazy for this idea, succeeded. Since Lenin was the first to succeed in capturing the state due to using the revolutionary route, global socialists argued that this was the optimal way. However, a dissenting group, who called themselves communists, said such a conclusion wasn't reasonable since Russia's revolution was based on an edge case scenario. They also undercut socialist Russia by having the same goals as socialists, but with the added stipulations that communism was to be a stateless and classless society since such goals weren't reached by Russia's state capitalism. Russia, after all its sacrifice to recover from the revolution, losing a war, and being invaded by France, Britain, and America, still had the state. Its economy was state capitalist, in which the state replaced capitalists in all enterprises, and workers only owned their means of production indirectly through the state, if ever. For the most part, their society still functioned very similarly to capitalism, as they still worked Monday through Friday for a small number of people who owned all businesses. Some would argue that this centrally planned system and its inflexibilities were the reason for the USSR's collapse. Regardless, the government seized the economy, but failed to transform it. Stalin declares in the 1930s that the Russians had succeeded in achieving socialism. Of course, this was a bit of a necessary lie for political reasons. The workers who had given so much already to the revolution didn't want their sacrifice to be in vain, and would have been very upset to hear that they had only come halfway. This lie also confused future generations, especially Americans, into equating socialism to government control, and communism to complete government control, when this is not the case. For instance, Medicare for All is not socialist. It's state capitalist since the state is doing the job of the capitalist in the same industry. Progressives happen to prefer the latter since it has less focus on profit and middlemen, making healthcare, in this example anyways, more accessible. Every economic system had both state and private versions. There were private and state slave owners. Kings, the state, in feudalism owned serfs, and so too did private individuals. Regardless, private and state are two versions of the same system, not different systems entirely. So, what do we do after capturing the state? This is an even more difficult question among socialists, since transition has only a few popular routes of happening, evolutionary, revolutionary, or anarchistic, while the socialism itself has many different forms, such as democratic confederalism and council communism. Most revolutionaries, such as Fidel Castro and Peter Kropotkin, believe that the first step after transition was stabilization, make sure everyone was still provided for and could survive during the transition. They did this by reconstructing society as it was pre previously, but booted out the capitalists and told them to either leave or be workers like everyone else. This is a key component that makes socialist transitions successful. They take power through state or anarchism, remove capitalists, and reconstruct. So, in conclusion, the end goal of post-capitalism is not to transition to statism, but to instead use the state to transition to post-capitalism. There are state and private forms of every economic system. The state-owning enterprise is not socialism, but instead state capitalism. Anti-capitalists disagree both on how to transition to a post-capitalist society, and also disagree on what a post-capitalist society looks like. 
to have a high likelihood of achieving post-capitalism, one must have a revolution that assesses the environment of a country and applies the best fitting kind, remove capitalists from society, and reconstruct society to provide for everyone's needs to give the people a grace period to decide how they wish to organize their post-capitalist society.